makes a bed in your ear for the cicada's shrill noise to lie down on. This is your station on three feet of earth that rests on clay flooding daily as the forest turns to steam and back to forest. There is no light here except what filters through the trailing greens. All that remains is to stare into the tapestry, pulling apart fibers and turning back the leaves. You have imagined the Quetzal so often. It became familiar before it was real. A sighting is always too much to hope for until you bite into the humidity and the long feathers trail right before you in the space between stillness and invisibility. And closer to home, this comes from down in the area near Patagonia in southern Arizona on one of the many trails. I believe this trail was named after Jeffrey Platts, if any of you were aware of Jeffrey, who died some years ago. And he was also from England and did a lot for um, the desert and our awareness of it. Dusk's Trail. From the Mesquite Grove to the crest of the first hill, is a short climb. From here to the Ocotillo, a few more steps through windswept grass where the trail winds to a view of a vulture sky in fading light. Set your watch to the rising moon. Catch the gray hawk's shadow as it falls. Listen to the small birds calling and watch the air part for the herons as they sail toward the night. The fences are all broken here and distance is all in your mind. With red earth to the north, pale stones underfoot, waves of ochre before you and the green breath of cottonwoods flowing from a hidden stream, you must decide how far to go. The only map is on the soles of your boots and the only bird still visible is the vermilion flycatcher whose plumage is the spark drawing you to its source. And even closer to home, where we are, we get to watch the birds by day, and when we're really lucky, at night we hear the calls. An owl's calls slide along shafts of moonlight that never reach the ground. The bird looks out from a pine tree where he can see every shiver below. A second call buffs against the first and there's call and response star to star. It's the sound a dream makes as it leaves the mind of someone sleeping or a heart's complaint that having tired of its lonely treadmill, it longs to fly. About 20 years ago, I wrote some very, very short poems about birds and I sent them to an extremely obscure website and didn't look very pretty at all. But surprisingly, the editor of this rather nice anthology of bird poems seems to have been doing an extensive search and asked if she could use my turkey vulture poem. (laughs) So this, along with an illustration of a vulture from India, uh, is the turkey vulture. The bird of the blood hangs from the sun on a rack of bones. It is never alone when it rests with its shoulders hunched, looking for an open wound to receive its penitent head. (laughs) A lot of people don't like vultures, but they do good work. (laughs) Now this is another bird that you would see on higher ground. If you go up to Prescott, you see lots of acorn woodpeckers. The Sky Islands in the southeast of the state where we love to go, they're very, very common. Now, this is fine, but there are, this is also about people who go bird watching and they spend a lot of money and they keep 
really detailed life lists. Very often you wonder whether they've actually seen the birds, but they've got an awful lot of check marks. We're back in southern Arizona again here. Red cap, clown face, pupil in a bullseye framed in black that flows along the wings and down its back, white that flashes when it flies, beak that beats a steady rhythm in the bark. As it works to store away a stock to last, the bird is always busy. It never makes itself scarce among the oaks next to streams running fast in the spring, and its voice is a screech close to chattering so constantly that observers hear the scents around them in its call. There's one on a yucca stalk, another clinging to a desiccated stem, and another bouncing on sunlight. I once saw a lady from Texas with bouffant hair and high-priced binoculars look away because she wanted something rare to be her long-awaited, breathlessly anticipated five Hundredth life bird. <laughs> to have a healthy bird population means we need healthy forests. And a few years ago, I was lucky to be included among a group of artists, the others were visual artists, taken around the Kaibab Plateau by experts in forest management, firefighters, and the object was to take the artists out, educators, send us home to produce art, which became an exhibition, uh, Fires of Change, that's had three runs in different southwest cities. And basically, it's a real eye-opener because you you go out and you see forests and we, we make lots of assumptions. Fire is not a bad thing. One of the problems that we have today is that we've had too few fires. We're just getting the wrong kind of fire. So, as a result of the studies that we made and uh, I, a little further research, I ended up writing a whole little book that has drawings in by... Um, an artist, Julie Komnick, who actually drew charcoal drawings of fires around Arizona with charcoal from the fires. The poems were not written with a pen or charcoal, but on a modern keyboard and computer. This is about the wildfire. Beginning unobtrusively, This fire climbs from fallen needles when the forest floor is dry. It likes to hide while nobody notices the first flame taste the pine cones lying around it. And with an appetite for more, it rides a wind gust until it reaches the crowns of trees in its path and takes them without ever looking back. Faster uphill than down, it outruns those who would chase it and spreads itself wide so as to make itself visible for miles, although from distance it is impossible to see how it drinks grass, chews trees, and spits out broken boughs when even birdsong is burning. These are three of the birds uh, affected one way or another because they live in the forest and they, they like the forest to be a certain way, nicely spaced trees. And um, if you're a flammulated owl, for instance, in the silence that survived the Europeans with their grazing herds, a little owl on a ponderosa pine is a layer of the bark until moths in fading light come to the old growth space where a long note calls and a claw comes down to cut the darkness open. And doing similar work in daytime, also with the same basic requirements, the northern goshawk. The goshawk remembers from its half-sheltered perch, the way the forest once was open enough for it to see where a grouse or a rabbit had stopped for the second it takes to dive two centuries back and to grasp the lost moment with talons so sharp 
They stop time. One thing we learned was that when fire comes, what grows back is not necessarily what burnt down in the first place. So, um, and also there are some birds, at least one bird that likes forest fires, and that's the three-toed woodpecker, the only woodpecker that lives on our continent and Europe. And the last one I saw was in a very, very burnt forest in New Mexico, and it was very happy because the insects in the burnt trees are exactly what it likes. Well, this is another end in the family, a short poem about the red-naped sapsucker. The tapping in the aspens is the memory repeating of ponderosas standing here before the fire. And one more, this is about uh, a mythological fire. I went to read newspapers from the uh, 19th and early 20th century. There are lots of reports of fires, but no fires on the scale that we see these days. The people who lived here before the Europeans came had a much better intuitive uh, knowledge of how to deal with the forests. And the Coconino Sun in 1912 included this. The Navajos have a tradition that long ago the god of fire became sorely displeased with the people of the earth and that in his anger he set fire to the world, driving their ancestors to the cactus country of the south. Of course, no mention of the fact that the god of fire would later come home and interfere with United States elections. <laughs> when time turns into wind, the trees stand helpless in its way. With a wink from the fire god's eye, flames rise in beauty, saying, Come with us, become change, become light. And all is changed, because men dismissed every warning, and ran until there was nowhere else to run to. Which brings us to where we are now and some of the, the work that uh, people with Audubon and other groups are doing. Uh, if any of you know the San Pedro River in the south of the state, one, it flows north, free-flowing river. It's vital to many, many migrating species. It's a wonderful place in Arizona that has lost so much of its riparian habitat. And there are court cases going on right now, and every time we think they're over, there's an appeal, and it goes on and on. Meanwhile, um, I got to thinking about the Lost River. Songbirds returning from the tropics looked for their river and found a dry bed where deer stood at dawn, licking stones. The beavers looked reproachfully from their dams, and the frogs summoned a final chorus before deflating into empty sacks. The bed was examined for fingerprints. Was this the work of terrorists? Or had a gang conspired to package the river in waterproof bags to sell, where drought planted fear on city streets? Had somebody come in the night? to steal it in buckets. The moon was called in for questioning. It yawned. Miles of yellow tape cordoned off the banks, although skunks sprayed disapproval and garter snakes stretched themselves out in the sun to replicate the shape of what they'd lost. The mist turned out its pockets to show all it had been hiding were the empty plastic bottles and rucksacks discarded by smugglers in the night. We sent a search party, which brought back a cup filled with pebbles and a sack of souvenir reeds. Photographs of the river in full flow were circulated door to door and posted on telegraph poles. Reports came in that rivers had been seen, but none was the equal of the one we'd lost. Not one possessed the same delicacy or bristled with green, broken light. Maps cracked along the line that once marked the river's passage and the signposts that pointed in its direction leaned over and fell into the dust. Politicians feigned remorse for having ignored security warnings and tried to make up by suggesting we replace it with mirrors 
while inside the white church on the desert the statues wept real tears. We collected them in vials to use in our rituals.